Thank you, Aaron. And uh, I was going to say, I'm much more interesting than that because I'm also a graduate of SLACE, 1984. So I'm delighted to be here this afternoon and honored to speak at my alma mater. And I was thinking as I was walking up Main Mall today, and certainly as I stand here today, it doesn't actually feel like such a long time ago that I was a student here at UBC. And so let me take you back. That year was 1981, and I was an undergraduate student of history, anxiously awaiting a letter from the newly minted Master of Archival Studies program, advising me on whether or not I was going to be accepted into the school. Well, I'd also applied to law school, um, which is what my parents wanted me to do. And I was really facing a dilemma. Do I pursue legal studies, which I had been talking about since I was 10 years old, or follow my passion in working with original manuscripts, documents, and records, and which was a direct result of some of the inspirational history professors that I studied under at UBC. And the 1970s, when I was a history student, was a heady time for history, Canadian studies, and the growth of museum and archives collection. So there was money, there was academic and public interest. And archival studies was an emerging profession and in North America in its infancy as an academic study. So it turned out that I was accepted into law school, but I decided at the end of the day, much to my parents' chagrin, that I would follow my passion and I really had a sense of a greater scope and probably a less conventional career in archival studies. You can tell me if you think it turned out that way. So about, uh, for about a dozen years after I graduated in 1984 as one of the first graduates from the Master of Archival Studies program, um, I worked as city archivist for the city of Richmond and then subsequently as the city archivist for the city of Calgary. And I made the move to FOI and information rights work when freedom of information laws were first introduced in, the Cana in Canadian provinces in the 1990s. Now, for some, and this predates a lot of the students and the faculty in this room today, but for some, working in FOI was akin to going over to the dark side. But in my view, it was a very natural move. So many of the, the ethical and the policy issues that archivists and information managers have always faced are very much in play in access and privacy work. And obviously, the proper management of information is absolutely foundational to both professions. Um, my first job in access and privacy was actually at the Calgary Health Region and health authorities in the 1990s in Alberta were just coming un under the Public Sector Act and the region needed somebody to steer and plan and manage their compliance program. Freedom of information was really the focus of that job. And back in those days, the requests were paper-based, there were no internet technologies, and most official documents were actually in paper form. So imagine. I left the health region at the turn of the century, and for the next 10 years, I focused almost exclusively on privacy work, first as a consultant, and then as a privacy regulator, first in Alberta, and then in Ottawa. And I had some very interesting times in my years in Ottawa working for the Federal Privacy Commissioner's Office and a lot of challenges trying to resolve privacy issues 
involving some of the world's online giants like Google and Facebook, whose applications in some instances flouted Canadian privacy law. So it's an honour and a pleasure to, to bring that experience back home. I've been in my position for 18 months so far and I'm having a lot of fun because I'm back in the thick of the access to information world and leading an office that is well known for a significant body of jurisprudence on access to information. So I have to say it's a fascinating time to be back in the information game. The open information and open data movement, which is really fueled by citizen demands for openness and transparency in government and really powered by online technologies, but it's fundamentally changing the information landscape. We have new voices at the Access to Information table, thank goodness. We have new channels for the dissemination of information. We have accelerated expectations of citizens to get access to data. And we have a call for data in the raw. So citizens are digging into data in earnest. And as they do, more and more organizations are actually willing to share it. And the result is a significant culture shift, I think, in how we think about and interact with information and data. And the evidence is all around us. Citizens are mashing and hacking and recombining new data, raw data, to create new applications. Musicians are releasing building blocks of their songs and empowering their fans to create new ones. Artists are posting their work online to seek the creative input of users. And academics are making their work available free of charge through online portals like the Circle Portal here at UBC. In the public sector, open information and open data are components of a much larger movement called Gov 2.0. Gov 2.0 attempts to provide more effective ways to deliver relevant information to citizens promises of transparency and openness and collaboration. So Gov 2.0 includes the integration of tools such as wikis, the development of government-specific social media sites, the use of blogs, RSS feeds, and all of these tools are helping governments provide information in a way that is more immediate and more useful to the people involved. So it's, I look at it as really letting routine disclosure into the FOI game. In the last two years, we've seen the open government movement gain real momentum internationally. Governments of the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, France, and New Zealand have all launched very ambitious programs. And closer to home, open government is now one of the BC government's top priorities. In fact, it was the Premier's first directive. 2011 saw the launch in BC of two online portals, Open Information and Open Data BC, which provides citizens with clear information about government and access to about 2,500 raw data sets. And that's the most significant publication of raw data sets in any provincial government in Canada. So through the open information portal, citizens can access documents posted through routine disclosure or as a result of responses to FOI requests. And through Data BC, citizens can access geographic and geospatial data through GeoBC and class size, composition, and student performance data from the Ministry of Education, 
birth and death statistics and chronic disease data from the Ministry of Health, and public accounts data, fully searchable, including public sector compensation, travel expenses, and employment statistics. And uh, just announced today, the province of BC is the first province in Canada to release its provincial budget data as open data, so 16 machine-readable and searchable data sets. So this is rich, complex data that could be the key in discovering new relationships, new variables, and maybe new solutions to the issues that are facing our province today. And of course, there's no single mashup that's going to fix these problems. But there is a potential for improved conditions. The local governments have also been really active in the open data game. So if you look to the cities of Vancouver, the cities of Nanaimo, they've released a whole wealth of data from the location of streets and alleyways and intersections to an entire catalog of the city's trees, parks, greenways, and water fountains. So through open data, you can rapidly identify public art, public places, you can locate rapid transit, and you can scour endless networks of city infrastructure like streetlights and water and sewage system. You can access zoning and property information, and you can read detailed reports on council meetings and minutes. And local government is really the level of government that's closest to the people. So I think municipalities are considered leaders in the open data movement to date. And I expect we're going to see a lot of cities coming on board with their open data, open information programs in the next two to three years. But where's it going next? The movement for open data doesn't stop there. I think advocates are constantly seeking fertile ground for new horizons and new growth, and there's no shortage of possibilities. For example, there's, there's a movement to take data portals across from across jurisdictions and unify them into one mega data portal for citizens. In December of 2011, the European Commission announced a proposal for open data strategy for all of Europe. And if the Commission has its way, there will be Europe-wide data portals and it will be mandatory for all public agencies to provide data in commonly used and machine-readable formats for citizens. And I think another area of growth is opening up private sector databases. A um, couple of examples, there are notable leaders in the private sector, including the World Bank, which has just released databa databases and data sets on international development and governance, global finance, and socioeconomic indicators like education and health. Or an Italian power company called Enel, and Lucian is going to correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, Enel, um, who recently released its first data sets on energy use and consumption as well as the details on the company's operations under a Creative Commons license. So this is pretty cool stuff. There's also talk of how citizens can take a more active role in open data, for example, by uploading geospatial data via GPS-equipped smartphones, or by filtering the government data stream to provide real-time information helping them actually navigate their morning commute. So these are all really promising avenues for future growth. And you knew there was a but coming. <laughs> but we have to remember that these, these are early days. And we have yet to see where this movement is going to play out. There's always a fear that the movement is going to lose momentum. 
And indeed, sometimes governments are quick to announce initiatives, issue directives, embracing all the opportunities of the technology without thinking the whole thing through. Our challenge, I think, is to try to figure out how we can stoke the fires of Gov 2.0 while also recognizing that open information and open data has to be implemented in a careful and thoughtful way. While we want to strike while the iron's hot, there is risk in moving too quickly. And it's absolutely critical that in the rush to provide online data sets that are relevant to citizens and relevant to businesses, that personal privacy is, is protected. And that's no simple task. So governments may remove identifiers from data sets, but given big data, given the power of analytics today, we're all making a mistake if we think we have privacy just because we've scrubbed the data. Um, scrubbing data isn't enough to keep our privacy interests protected. Examples of the failure of anonymization and the possibility of re-identification are actually quite common in the private sector. For example, AOL's release of anonymized search queries and Netflix release of a database of movie recommendations. And I think these were very altruistic moves on behalf of the companies to provide what they thought was scrub data that would be of general use to citizens and researchers. But regrettably, it resulted in identification of individual AOL and Netflix users. So as information and privacy commissioner, what am I doing about this? I obviously have a clear role to assist and advise as we work out these very important details. And my office has announced an audit of the BC government's Open Information Initiative, Open Data Initiative, to begin one year after their announcement of the policy. And we're going to be looking really closely at the type of data and the type of information that's been posted online, whether there is a continuous stream of data being added, and whether personal privacy is being protected in the publication of these data sets. So I'm going to continue to be a proponent of open government, but I will also be a very strong voice for the protection of privacy as we go down this road. We have to be careful also to monitor the quality of information that's coming online. So as a lot of people in this room are well aware, Data is useless if it's not relevant, if it's not up to date, and it, if it's not of sufficient quality. And it's equally useless if the data can't be accessed or searched or understood by the average person. And the question of how we, how we manage, how do we categorize, and how we archive the data so that the growing stream of information is manageable and useful is a very significant one to the people in this room. And it is going to fall to many of you to provide solutions that are going to work for organizations and for users and citizens. And I, I think that the principles and the best practices that, that you learn through your studies are really key to meeting this very important and challenging task. So I've talked about the role that commissioners play, and I've talked a little bit about the role that archivists and librarians and information managers can play. But I really think that the most significant voice in the movement is really the voice of citizens. So it's citizens that are going to push government into doing the right thing and getting the right information online. The people in this room, I think, can be champions of open government, and I'd, I'd really enjoy a discussion about how the, the community here has been thinking about open government and what are the voices of librarians and archivists in this movement. 
but the citizens are really the heart and, heart and soul of the movement and their demands for more openness and more transparency are actually going to drive the resources allocated to open information and open data. So I can't wait to see where this is going to go next. Those are my thoughts and uh, open it up for discussion and questions and thank you for your attention this afternoon. releasing the data sets, but where is your office coming to the uh, issue of where the data gets collected? So issues of government mandate, issues of um, what are people called surveillance, so for instance in the Vancouver riots. What's the issues of privacy on the, on the data generation end and, and requirements uh, or I mean, government mandate on what co is to be collected and made public and also how people the government is using data that's collected by citizens, right? right? Well, under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, the government has to have authority to collect personal information of citizens. And the authority either has to be in a statute or it has to be directly related to an operating program of, of the public body. So that's, you know, the authority to collect is under the Act. Once they have the data, though, Depending on how it's linked and how it's used, the data sets take on a different value. So, you know, information collected for um, the delivery of health care. So, collected from citizens to deliver their health. And you could see that from public health surveillance perspective, it's really important to get data sets out there. But depending on how the data is put together, it could potentially identify the individual again. So we have a lot of work to do at the outset, making sure government is collecting information by authority. But now we've got a whole bunch of other issues that we're going to have to worry about, which is you're going to put this data out there, but is it truly protected from pri a privacy breach or privacy abuse? So, so, I mean, is, is the police force at that point, are they an authority that, do they have the authority to collect cell phone images, things that are posted on Facebook? The police? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really complicated question, but if, if they have an active investigation underway on a specific individual, then they can collect information that's arguably in the public domain. Taking pictures, on the streets, um, open Facebook profiles, so those Facebook profiles are actually not restricted, that information's in the public domain. So the police actually have more authority to collect more information than any other category of, public of a public body. Um, some of you may have read um, just after the Vancouver riots when ICBC offered up its database of facial recognition technology to the Vancouver police so that they could identify pictures and videos and other information submitted to the police um, of alleged riders. Do you remember that story? So that's where our office stepped in and did a full investigation about whether or not it was acceptable under the law to collect information and use information for one purpose, which is driver's license fraud, that's why they're using facial recognition technology, is that actually available to the police for their law enforcement investigation? And the answer is no. So that offer was not taken up by the Vancouver police, um, partly through our intervention. And at the end of the day, we actually gave some really good guidance because most people haven't thought about a biometric database collected and used for one purpose, and then all of a sudden, does that mean it's open for the use by law enforcement? Yeah. The answer is no. <laughs> Took us 50 pages to write no. Yeah. 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 I, I just have, uh, I'm curious about how your office goes about investigations. Like, what are the teams made up of the expertise that you bring together, like, um, as you plan for the biz, big audit? in this area that's quite new and bringing things together. So there's a, I would just love to hear your insights on what you have found works well for those kinds of teams. I mean, yes. actually it's teams. 
Yeah, that's a great question. When I first came to the office, um, there was sort of one, one big team of investigators. Um, we called them portfolio officers, but we changed that name because I, I don't understand what that means. Um, so I have actually divided the office into two. And there's a team of investigators that investigate complaints as they come in the door. So very much a reactive role, statutory role. We take uh, requests for review related to freedom of information. We adjudicate those. That's our, we, we need to do that. That's our bread and butter work. But now I've created a policy and technology team. And that team is the team that's looking at the issues that are on the horizon, like open information and open data, either to do systemic investigations and audits like the one I, I just mentioned to you, or to write guidelines, to give speeches, to do education. So it's, it's that whole other side of the, of the office. And I've hired some um, technology experts to work with us because increasingly the challenges that we have are related to internet technologies, new technologies, biometrics. I mean, how do we, and how do we actually understand big data, analytics? We, we, we need that. And um, our office is mostly made up of lawyers and people with degrees in public administration, a couple of people with an information management background. But what I need increasingly are technologists that understand this and then can link it to the law and the policy implications. Yeah, so a restructured office. And I was also fortunate to get five new staff positions approved this year um, because we are increasingly looking at data linking, data linkages, and the implications for privacy. So our office has grown a little bit. So open government means open to everybody, open to citizens, to public or private researchers, and to companies around the world, um, or possibly. Are, is there some, who would be assessing who ultimately the users end up being and to what use the data is put? And if it's found that it's not actually citizens that primarily use it, is that justification for reallocating those resources somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the government that decides so it's the various government ministries. Let's take the provincial government for an example. Because by policy, all of the ministries now, by directive, have to actually publish data in open format. So they've been tasked, each ministry, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Finance, have been tasked to identify data sets that they think are of interest to the public, either because they get a number of requests from researchers, from citizens, from media, et cetera, et cetera, for that data. That's probably one of their assessment criteria. But they have to publish, and they have to have plans to publish this data on an annual basis. And it's actually tied to, this is a really good part, the publication of this data and the submission of their plans and the implementation is, is tied to the deputy minister's performance pay. Yay. So I think that's a, that's a driver, because otherwise it's not required in law to publish data. It's required under the provincial government by directive of the premier, and it's tied to some incentives. But what I want to do is audit, take a look at what the policy is, and see what's actually come out the other end, and how many people are using the data. Um, I never thought of who's using the data. You think that would be an argument for them to pull back if it's not average citizens? I don't know. I mean, it's entrepreneurs and businesses and journalists, and they're using the data, which ends up in the public domain, too, the way they use it and the way they report on it. So did that answer your question? I wish it was in law. So you know, I think the next, the next time our public sector law is reviewed, five years from now. I, I think that would be a really good area for law reform, is a mandatory requirement for the publication of information and data sets. And I think there should be, I mean, we should be able to figure out by that time what kind of data sets are of most use to the public. 
Um, well, related to this, at one point there was a big discussion at the city of Vancouver about releasing data sets like those related to sewers and similar things for fear of terrorism. So not so much the privacy issue, but too much knowledge. Public safety. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's another consideration. Yeah, that's another consideration. Um, I'll give you an example about public safety. It's certainly, it's not all about privacy. That's my lens. But um, um, the government of BC gets a lot of requests for the calendars of cabinet ministers and deputy ministers and MLAs. So where are they and who are they meeting with and et cetera, et cetera. And the government had so many requests for this data that they decided that's a good idea. We should publish the calendars of deputy ministers and ministers. This sounds like a really good idea because we're getting all these FOI requests and most of it has to go out under the Act. So let's just publish it. And then they, the RCMP did a risk assessment on the publication of this data and I just got a three-page letter from the minister saying, guess what, we're not going to do it because of safety issues because, you know, who knows what can happen. Somebody's stalking the premier or a deputy minister. Or, so yes, privacy is not the only implication. Um, but it certainly is a focus of mine because I'm very concerned about the linkage of databases and taking a data set that's published by the Ministry of Health and the linking of uh, publicly available data sets. And we, you know, the power of the analytics, it's, it's of concern. It's certainly an area, I think, of, of study and certainly leadership in this community. Um, and maybe you can tell me about whether there are some leading voices in this community in open information and open data. Yeah. I just have a question as you reflect, if you could just reflect on your the education that you had here and your back, your history of really enjoying the history classes that you took and in developing an appreciation for manuscripts and records and the historical perspective. And now we're moving into this age and you're talking about all of these sort of government 2.0 initiatives and what kinds of records are being kept of these kinds of communications as you do your daily, how much of that comes to mind for you, even though that's not your primary job description. I find it really frustrating that it's not, I mean, it's not my jurisdiction anymore. So I see things and I think, what can I do about that? And um, I'm not sure if I can do anything. I mean, one of, my, one of my frustrations is I think our office needs to have a closer relationship with the VC, VC archives and with archivists, but it's my, it's my professional passion but our office doesn't really have jurisdiction there. I mean, I, I'm frustrated that there's been no transfers from the government to the BC archives since 2003, looking at Luciana. I learned that when I, when I landed in this job and I thought, that is shameful. You know, where's, where is our historical record? Um, it's not directly my responsibility. Um, can I do anything about it? You know, maybe some influence, maybe some discussion in the back room. It may be something that the Auditor General is more properly tasked with because there's an interest there in the preservation of documents and accountability. Not so much mine. But yeah, it is frustrating to, to have a passion and love and an understanding. With all of these new, I mean, that's, yeah. Um, I wonder when you're approaching a problem and there's a particular philosophy associated with how you would, what do you go through when you think about a new problem in the area? Uh, is there sort of an overarching view, an ethical perspective that you use or somebody's perspective that you send us all to read? <laughs> um, what's my methodology in approaching a problem like open data or open information or? Yeah, so there's some new set of data. Personally, I'm, we're, we're grappling, I was grappling here with um, the data that's generated in the learning management system. 
privacy use. If you face a problem like that one, how do you start thinking about it? What are, you, what are the well, questions you're asking? I think principles and ethics is where I start. And I, and I think I, I know that comes out of my background and my training in this place. And I think that's quite different than my predecessor um, who approached these issues in a very legal manner. So I'm not a lawyer, didn't go to law school. Uh, maybe I should have done both. I don't know. I don't approach the problem that way. I think I, I, first of all, I try to look at it more holistically. How does the organization, be public sector or private sector, want to collect or use this information? So what's the business value of the data that's in front of them? And then I, then I think of the users, and I think of the public policy challenges and the public interest in it, and then I try to fit it into the law. And it's a good thing that I'm surrounded by some lawyers who constantly remind me that maybe I should have started with the legal issue first. But I can't do that. And I actually think it's healthy to have more of a public policy approach to some of these challenges because sometimes you can't actually, you can't actually fit them into the legal framework that we have right now, which is a, a piece of legislation drafted in the 1990s for 21st century technology. I, you know, it, it is a challenge, and if you start with that higher level, I guess, public policy approach to it, and looking at the organization, and looking at the users, and then get to the legal place, um, I'm going to have to get there at the end of the day anyway. But in the example that I gave you of the, um, the facial recognition technology, nobody had really thought about that before. And, you know, I have this sort of, I have a test. Just to see how the public would respond to something, I asked my mother. It's like my mother test. So I say, okay, mom, is, I mean, does this give you, does this actually, is this a creepy use? Does it, does it sort of go into that, that category where you say, there's something not quite right here, but I don't know what it is. So, or ask my neighbor, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about the police having open access to biometric data where you know, they're going to search through the entire database, searching the innocent for a potential connection of the guilty. Where, where does that sit with you, Mom? You know, so it's, it's a good starting point for me. Um, otherwise, you know, it, it, it is easy just to bury yourself in the law. Yeah. Hi. So I work for the provincial government, libraries and literacy, and we actually have one of the leading ministries for, for releasing data sets, and so we, we also uh, released uh, data sets around libraries and digital data. My, my, my concern is all this stuff gets released, and who does something with it? You know, you can pull together the hack fest. Um, who's kind of cultivating the community to understand what one can do with all this stuff? And my thinking on that is that libraries are extremely well positioned on this whole issue. It's all about open access to information and facilitating community. And libraries, uh, libraries have become more and more about creative um, collaboration spaces, learning spaces, and all of that. So there is no uh, profession out there that, that is really leading this. And thinking about the whole community development piece of it. So how do you help the public understand what this stuff can get? What, this, what information they can get from this, and how do you kind of pair up the, the technology types, the, the, the hacker types, with the, say, the nonprofits who actually have a problem with this all? You know, like how, do you, how do you put together those, those two communities to actually produce the meaningful and relevant um, you know, visualizations, applications, uh, information? Standards? Who's putting yeah. together the standards? Who's putting together the standards? Yeah. So I was thinking that I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I'm also thinking we're in the right room for that discussion. <laughs> and I'd love to hear from the people from Slaves on that as well. I'm just going to start by saying that um, I think that the technologists are a very loud, they're, they're a very loud voice right now. I don't think necessarily the right voice to lead this. And um, one of the things we're going to do for Right to Know Week next September is sponsor a workshop. And I really want it to be quite practical, um, not theoretical, but practical about what's happening in BC on open information, open data, 
and what are the what are the public policy questions that we're grappling with and I would just I mean just coming here today light bulb goes on I mean working with the library community to come to that workshop to have some discussions and some some dialogue to move this forward because and and everybody else jump in that's a good idea yes so um, I, see, I see that the open government is kind of an extension of, of e-government, which has been around for quite a while. And one of the things that, in response to your question, one of the things that's happened there uh, is that government front-end offices, face-to-face -face offices, have uh, reduced their hours or uh, cut staff, closed, uh, closed uh, uh, access points, because everything is online, with the assumption that people can can fill out the forms and find the forms, fill out the forms, and do all, all that work. Uh, and it has affected the public libraries in particular, where a lot of people are using the computer terminals there and then are also act, asking for help to fill out the forms or you know, understand the language of those documents. So in, in Canada, there hasn't been much research done there. We, we did a little study of that little questionnaire. But in the United States, there's been quite a bit of research that shows that public libraries are really um, taking a lot of responsibility there, and in some cases partnering with government agencies to together provide kind of more effective service. So that, uh, I think the same thing we can see here with the data sets is that somebody has to be uh, available, and if the government is not going to put resources into supporting citizen use of these things, then, well, they should be giving the libraries or someone else <laughs> some money to, to develop those services. Uh, so I, I think that that is a direction we need to go. At the moment, I'm not sure that, uh, that, that we are producing students who can jump directly into that kind of data set work. And that's, that's something that I, I think we need to work on. Just add another anecdote about the, um, the, the changes um, in the e-government. Um, uh, I was in the US. That, people were noticing that the, the social welfare forms went from physical forms to electronic forms. And what happened with the physical form is everybody would take it home, they take it with the family, and help everybody fill it in. But then when it had to be done online, they had to go to a government office, and they went on their own. They had nobody help fill it out. So some of those implications of where you fill out the forms in order to get freedom of information or uh, you know the instructions on how to do things, the, the social network that help people fill this out, uh, was being dismantled. Right. And nobody really thought that through. Nobody so it's like, get these forms online, this is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the same thing, so your point is, is that information, open information, open data, it's the same. There's, a, right. there's the same set of challenges, but we don't really have a champion that's thinking through the solution to all of these. It's sort of, it's pockets of advocacy but there's no, there's no profession that's leading this through with protocols and policies and standards and best practices and all the things that needs to be done. It's very ad hoc. I'd like to think that information schools are doing that. <laughs> I think one of the other things is, is the platforms things run on. So if you're going to do fancy graphics, how good a computer do you need to do it? So, and releasing things on Windows and then you evaluate everybody with a Mac. If you release things on, if, you, if the general if population has only cell phones or iPads, what's being released onto those platforms? So even the, the consideration of what the order of release on the platforms of the data is and how complicated it is to, to use the like GIS was very difficult. It's become a bit easier, but it's still not uh, something you can just, you can't just start doing it. Right, so thinking through these technical challenges is, is one aspect, aspect of it, but then the, the policy and the approach and the ethics and the best practice is the other piece. Yeah. Yeah. The other side, I mean, there's an area called e-democracy, e which is another, uh, of course you know that, but I mean, some of that is about the discussion of these. So um, if you are going to release some kind of data, where's the discussion platform that goes with the data. So you say, hey, look, I found this trend. Now what? You, what does the person do with the knowledge that they, they've derived from the data sets? And where can they discuss that? How can they bring that back into policy? So in, in a sense, it's the whole chain of data use. Uh, 
uh, from the original collection all the way through privacy and the release, but once you've done the analytics, who do you show it to? How do you distribute that? Right, and I think the provincial government's platform has a place for some of the discussion and, you know, has feedback and questions and, you know, all, but I, but I think it has to be built in and it's, it's relatively unsophisticated right now. But we need to think through this entire chain, which goes back to your example of e-government. So if you had uh, a magic wand or something, what would you like for your office to have in terms of perhaps Door, you know, uh, if you could have just a bit more, um, perhaps power, or, you know, in terms of the, the the issues that you see out there and, and what you are able to take steps towards. You know, if you do an audit, then you can release a report. Um, we have, I think, we have sufficient invest investigation powers. We have order making powers. So I'm okay with my power. Um, I think the government needs some changes to the statute that moves towards a legislative requirement to do some of these things. And I also think that there should be a duty to document. That's another whole discussion we could have about that. But I, I worry about um, text messaging and pin to pin and, and the way that records do not exist for major decisions. So that goes back to, I guess that's a place I can play as uh, information commissioner. But I think there should be a duty to document in our law. Um, I think there should be a whole classification of records and data that should be required to be published in a certain open format. And it shouldn't be policy, it should be in law. And we should have enforcement powers for that. And then I think, um, in terms of budget, I should have like 20, 30 more people to do the job that we need to do um, in BC. Yeah, good luck with that. Now, all these data sets that are published, well, eventually then become obsolete and substituted by a data set. Where do they end up? Is there a required permanent preservation for whatever has been made public and used as source of whatever decision? That's part of the policy audit that I talked about. We are going to be pointing out where the policy has, has needs to be developed, needs to be shored up with some of those considerations. And that might also be a backdoor into my issue about the lack of preservation of records and the transfer of, of data into permanent repository. But the, you know, again, it's an example of a policy that was developed for all the right reason, a directive, all the right reasons. Let's get this stuff out there. It was a huge resource implication for the provincial government as one example. But the end, the thinking at the end of the policy is not there. The preservation, the integrity, the data use analysis, that's a whole other piece. What about traceability? These are data that are taken from records. Is the link maintained? Who is responsible for this? Accountability. Yeah. So it's a whole other issue. So this, I think this audit is, is going to be very important because I see it as setting some milestones and some standards for data set publication. We have time for maybe uh, one more question. Is there uh, any, any students that, that have any questions for, for Elizabeth? Mm -hmm. any, any, anything you'd like to Do you want to ask what Luciana looked like in 1983? <laughs> Just as beautiful as today. <laughs> Four. 84? <laughs> when you're hiring those five people, what are you looking for? Great question. So they can hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm looking for people who have um, a head for policy that understand information management and also are comfortable with technology. So it's, it's really all about technology today. And the average age in my office, I hate to say, is probably mid-40s, so I'd really like to balance that 
with more youngsters that are really comfortable with technology. Oh, this is being taped, isn't it? Staff <laughs> will hear that. Um, but we've, we've got a, I think that would be a really good mix in our office to have folks with a lot of, who have a lot of experience and legal backgrounds in public administration balanced with people who know how to think about information management and new technologies. So that's what I'm looking for. Check our, bo our job postings, they're still open. Okay. Right, well, thank you very Thanks much. very much. Yes.